<laughs> it's the day after St. Patty's Day. And I don't have my green on anymore. Tomorrow was the day for that. <laughs> Uh, in the year 2003 on the campus of Plattsburgh State at Champlain Valley Hall and we're ready to dive again into the French connection with Dr. Sylvie Boudreau. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's, a, yeah. it's great to be here. And it's great to be anywhere after St. Patty's <laughs> Day in the North Country, I'll tell you that. It was a great day for the Irish and the French and any other nationality. And the weather was so beautiful yesterday. Oh, my goodness, we've been blessed. And we haven't always said that in our programs. The last five or six programs, we've been bemoaning North Country temperatures and snow. But the weather has been great. And even today in the 30s, is quite tolerable compared to some of those 40, 50, and 60 below chill factors that we've uh, waded through. Chapters one and two, I told you we would be back. Yes, you said you'd be back for number three, four, five, and beyond. What, whatever it takes. I want to know what the responses have been to the program. Oh, the response has been really overwhelming and really positive. And I just wanted to say, you know, to your viewers, thank you for coming up to me and telling me how much you enjoyed it. Because, um, I don't know, it was just so neat to see so many people walk up to me and say, are you the lady I saw on TV? That was really interesting. And I watched it from start to finish and learned a lot and really appreciated it. And it's so wonderful. So it kind of makes me feel really good about doing this. And as a result, I'm kind of like cr cranking out more and more stuff to show your viewers. So um, all the positive comments are kind of feeding my, uh, feeding, feeding my desire to, eat, to do even more. Because this is a really big field and there's a lot to be said about it. And, um, and you know, I, I think it's important to point out that a lot of historical work has been done on this uh, field. And that there's, we do know a lot about the Franco-Americans. We might not n know as much as we'd like to about the North Country experience, but we're sort of we're, as you once said, we're sort of painting in those brush strokes, right? <laughs> Don't you love it? Just, just fill in the canvas as we go. It pleases Calvin and I to hear those comments as well, because as you know, Calvin especially has been doing this for 20 years, and I've been doing it since 1997 with Calvin on the television, and we enjoy doing it. It's basically a labor of love. We would love to be able to make a couple of dollars off it, and so we do ask for underwriting if people like our program get a hold of Calvin at Hometown Cable, two words in Champlain, and tell them about it because we do think it's a worthy project. No matter who we talk to, somebody has a connection somewhere along the line. In your case, with the, with the French connection, almost everybody is directly or indirectly related to somebody who came down here way back when for all the reasons you mentioned in program number one and that's what's so neat about it i've had people say that was my my house down there you know or yeah my ancestors went to that church and right. so everybody's got a connection yeah those one of my names was on that marble yeah. plaque or yeah and so I, many comments and that's wonderful it, and it's it's interesting because when i was watching your 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 program at the end when you sort of you, you sort of have a kind of fundraising request and you sort of put the name of all the donors and then most of those names are french franco-americans so i think wow there's so all these people who gave money are now hearing about their culture so <laughs> that's good give us 50 bucks after <laughs> this show don't you <laughs> all of a sudden they're all irish again right <laughs> so what direction are we going to take for chapter number three so well, chapter number three I thought that I thought what we would do is take a little pause and maybe not so much deal with the local community but now that we've kind of built up some knowledge of the background of this migration of French Canadians to the United States what I want to try to do is put that migration that happened here in the North Country into a larger historical context and talk about the mass migration of French Canadians to the United States in general. And I thought what I would do is show your viewers a collection of about 50 slides that I have. So uh, if we spend a minute on every slide, that's already going to be an hour. So, uh, so we have a lot <laughs> I to accomplish. Doing already. Calvin going, change the slides. You got change. 49 more. You got 40. Keep it going. <laughs> Keep, we're going to scroll through really quickly. No, we're going to actually take our time. That's take great. the time that, it, that we need to sort of, of you know, yeah, to sort of see the significance of all these things. And I brought in a, a few props uh, as well that are going to supplement the discussion. And very, very kind of optimistically or foolishly, 
I'd like to do a whole other show on the North Country names. So that'll make, but there are so many of them. We're going to go from Archambault to Tremblay, or yeah, you know, we'll, and we'll do all the different spellings and the different, and so people will be able to recognize what their original name was. So that's, I love that, it. You that'll love be, that. yeah, yeah, so we'll have a, a really good time doing that. And I have that's a feeling we, ha we might have to do another volume for that. <laughs> sure. So we're, um, you know, going, yeah. going onward. So, uh, so, right, so what I wanted to do is just sort of say that, um, that one of the interesting things about doing this subject for me is, you know, I've been living in Plattsburgh for s quite a few years now, and as soon as I arrived here, I thought, well, you know, this is a borderland community, it's close to Quebec, uh, and, you know, as soon as I came into this building, got my office here, people told me, well, this used to be an old, fr uh, an old hospital run by French nuns. And so I started to sort of like, you know, realize that there's, there is a, there is a Franco-American connection here. And then I found the church, St. Peter's, and I found their cemetery. Then I start going up along the shores of Lake Champlain, seeing what I could find there. And, you know, sort of slowly began to realize that not, you know, totally not surprisingly that this area was, you know, some of the earliest settlers were from Canada. And, you know, and that there's a, and, you know, I would drive through the streets or just, like, driving out to, like, the, the, the ferry, and I'd see, like, rural mailbox with names like, you know, Perrier or Perrault or, or silos with, with French names on them and say, well, gee, a lot of French people moved here, you know. So it started to sort of seep in. And when I was observing this, I was thinking to myself, well, you know, I, I did a PhD on this subject. You know, it wasn't necessarily about this area, but it was about the whole movement of French Canadians to the United States. So I was trying to piece in the local experience into the wider sort of, you know, uh, understanding of this mass migration. So I think what I'd like to do t today for your viewers um, is to talk about, um, or just to emphasize the fact that is maybe not so well known that, that the province of Quebec is a little bit like Ireland or southern Italy in that it was a place that in the 19th century experienced a mass emigration of people leaving, mainly to go to the United States. And I think this is something that is not that well re understood or realized that, that you know, um, how could how could you know how could a North American society, a New World society, that's you know there's a lot of like it's lots of wide open spaces. It's a, it's a you know it's a new relatively new country compared to old Europe, and why is it that that Quebec was losing so much of its population, and you know and so it, it wasn't a question of thousands of people le leaving, it was hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, one of the things that historians have grappled with, not that successfully, is trying to measure it. You know, finding, finding a kind of, um, what, you know, finding some kind of accurate way to measure this mass migration has kind of eluded historians. Because most of the, uh, most of the measurement tools that are available, either sense, sense, uh, census materials or border, border, uh, border records, are in, each of them are incomplete in some way or, or, or can't be compared over the decades or each of them has some kind of structural flaw that makes it kind of very hard to estimate it. So most of the estimates we have as to the extent of this, the timing, you know, how many people left per decade, right? So the timing of the migration and also the total amount of people who left, we, do, we don't really have an absolute accurate figure. What we have is a kind of an estimate. And I would say that in most cases, the estimate is rather conservative. Because a number of people came to live, because uh, here's what's interesting. C Quebec, like Italy, southern Italy or, or Ireland, or even the British Isles in general, experienced this mass migration. But the difference between Quebec and those European societies is that the migrants didn't have to cross the ocean to get here. I mean, they were relatively proximate to their homes, and so a lot of them would actually not sell their farms, keep their farms, put a crop in in the spring, then you know move, move down to the to the states, you know, and work, and then like take six weeks off in the fall and go do their harvest and then come back. So you had this kind of back and forth movement, or else they'd go visit their families, or you know they would you know they'd have um, this kind of you know in their minds they hadn't really gone that far they were still pretty close to home, so they could always go back. And so because of this back and forth movement, that also fudges the figures, right? Because if people are coming and going, that's, that's kind of, you know, these border crossings that are being counted, but maybe they're not permanent, uh, yeah. you know, a permanent migration. 
So because of this, back, and you know, and a lot of people came to places like Plattsburgh uh, when they had small children, worked really hard for 10 or 12 years, saved a lot of money, and then went back to Quebec and went back to their farms and made a go of it or had a better life. So, so, so if we rely on local, like New York State or federal census materials, we're only counting the people who stayed. We're not counting the people who came and went or the people who went back. So that's why the figure is, is always a conservative, is, a, is an underestimate are always conservative. So one of the kind of, um, one of the best ways I, I, can, I can express this to you without using too much statistics or gobbledygook <laughs> is, is to say that historians pretty much agree. One historian has argued that by the year 1900, by the turn of last century in 1900, one out of every three Quebecers was now residing in the United States. Wow. Uh, yeah, one out of three. So one third of the population was now living somewhere in the you know south of the border, and so that's a pretty big figure. That's a pretty astonishing, uh, sure astonishing is. statistic. And so that would mean that would that would mean like the North Country, New England, the Midwest, uh, and even as far as California. So they they were mobile. They traveled a lot. Goes back to the old coureur de bois, right? The old French fur traders who you know took the canoe and you traveled, traveled really far. Let us pause just a moment to make sure we've got something on this tape before we progress with this very interesting topic. Maybe <laughs> you'd like to call several of your friends and tell them to turn the TV on. We got a good show going on today. <laughs> we got something on tape, so we're doing great. And while the camera was shut off, Calvin was talking about his ancestors coming back and forth across the border as if to underline what you were talking about. It's great. Yeah, I mean, I wish Calvin had kept the, the camera going when he told us about about how his his ancestors were border crossers. Kind of confirms confirms that this was not just stuff that you know historians write sure. about, but it actually really happened. So, um, so one of the I guess one of the one of the problems, the questions that have bedeviled his, the historians, which I talked about in earlier uh, earlier uh, segments of the series, is why were why were the people of Quebec having to leave their their ancestral homeland? And um, so the whole question of the motivation behind people leaving is kind of uh, a complex one. And I think Calvin put it, Calvin put it uh, pretty well uh, as the camera was off, and actually both of you did, which is that basically if you had really large children, uh, the, uh, by, the mid, by, by about the 1830s, if you had a large family with lots of children, um, you needed somewhere for your sons to take new land and to f have farms of their own, or you essentially needed something to employ your sons. I mean, they needed to some do something with their idle hands. And if there was no land in the neighborhood or in the neighboring county, uh, you know, t for them to settle, then they they had to either you know they had to either leave or move to the move to the United States or move to some other part of Canada and take up land in more remote areas, uh, far from their family and far from that kind of support. So, um, so one historian called, uh, his name is Alan Greer, said that what happened in the Richelieu Valley, which is just north of us, is that uh, farmers would divide their land up amongst their sons uh, until the, the plots got to be so small that they were not economically viable. So that just caused more poverty. So, um, so the, so, so, so in today's show, we're going to try to get a sense of some of the some of the you know things that motivated people to come to the United States, and I think what we can all agree upon is that what attracted French Canadian families to move to the United States, especially if they had children that were enough children that were old enough to work in factories at a time when child labor was accepted, acceptable. Um, of course, you couldn't have little infants work, but if a child was eight and looked strong, uh, you know, like a kind of fudge it and let the child work at some sort of menial task uh, in the mill. So often, entire families were employed uh, as a unit in a particular, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in a particular mill. So, uh, so child labor was acceptable. So if you had children, uh, then you could, uh, they might, you know, too many mouths to feed might be a, a, a problem on a farm. Uh, where you didn't have a lot of money or too many kids to send to school or to clothe, it's all very expensive. Uh, you know, children can be a drain on resources on a farm, but they can be a boon in an industrial city where they can all be put to work. And, give their, and in those days, children worked for the family economy. They gave their wages to their parents and the parents subdivided it up and you know, may, actually saved some money and people had better, better lives as a result. So, um, so I guess the question, the question that we, that we want to deal with is, 
you know, did people move to the United States or places like Plattsburgh, to the North Country, to like Keysville, uh, Plattsburgh, Malone, uh, Champlain? Did they move there because they were immiserated and starving, or did they move? You know, wh wh like how how bad how badly were they were they doing? You know, were they you know how poor were they? And my answer to that is kind of um, is an interesting one in that I think that that in many cases the French Canadians that migrated to the North Country, obviously there's a range of motivation, and obviously there were probably some people that were, that were desperately poor. Um, but in most cases, essentially, I think what it was is large families, lots of children, uh, too many mouths to feed, not enough land to settle them on, and essentially, I think what happened especially south of Montreal, which is, I think, you know, most of the people who came to this area were coming from the Richelieu Valley. And I have reasons for why I know that, which I'll get into uh, at, a, at a later date. Um, if people were coming from the Richelieu Valley, um, here's what's interesting. Um, here's a, the, the, the picture that we see up here on the, we're gonna see a lot of slides today. And the picture that we see, the first slide that I wanna show you is a slide that um, shows you a typical habitant farmhouse. Uh, and this is a, a, a kind of a relatively recent photo. It, it comes from the 1930s. Uh, but this is a typical habitant uh, farmstead. And what you see about it is that, well, two things kind of pop out at us that I want to say is that many of you might have noticed that the minute you cross the border, actually even around here, the minute you cross the border, you notice you're sort of coming off the, if you're coming up the I-87, you're coming through the Adirondacks, and suddenly, right around, uh, right around, you know, split the what? What is it? Um, Poco moonshine. You come through Poco moonshine, and suddenly you come down, and you realize that everything becomes very flat. And as you go north up into Montreal, you also notice as you're driving on the on Route 15, it's, it becomes incredibly flat, and you can see far in the distance. You can you can see Montreal about 20 miles before you get to it. You can see the the mountain in St. Joseph's Oratory. So it's pretty interesting. So what happens is essentially you're coming out of a geological zone, which is the Adirondacks, and you're coming into a new geological zone, which is the St. Lawrence floodplain. The air, like the air, the area that after the last ice age, the glacier melted and essentially flooded this whole area. So this whole area was underground, and if you if you were to dig, you'd find like fossils with you know marine oh, little sure. marine life in them. So it's very flat because it was because essentially this was a floodplain. So what we see in the slide is that it's very flat. No, I mean, not that it's that obvious, but there's a forest in the background that's not a mountain. So it's very flat, but here's, here's another good side of it. It's also extremely fertile, exceedingly fertile. Um, this area, the Richelieu Valley, is known as the breadbasket of Quebec, or it was known as a breadbasket of Quebec. If you look at the soil as you're going up to Montreal, if it's spring or fall and you see that the farmers have tilled the soil, you'll see that it's this very rich kind of brown, sort of, uh, sort of, uh, sort of rich, rich soil. So, so people of Quebec were not leaving Quebec uh, because the soil was no good or because the farms were not productive. The farms were inc incredibly productive. Uh, it's an incredibly fertile area. But what we see from this picture is um, it's a substantial dwelling. It doesn't look, doesn't, it, there's nothing unusual about this picture. It doesn't, look ver, it doesn't look very rich, neither does it look very poor. There's sort of outlying buildings behind the house. You can see it's a large house, probably to house quite a large family. There's outlying buildings, and you see the barn is whitewashed with, uh, it's whitewashed, it's not painted. Uh, and it's a typical Quebec habitant's uh, dwelling. And my mother uh, would love, I'm sure she'd like me to point this out to you, that in those days, Quebec, uh, in the countryside when she was growing up, she remembers growing up and seeing beautiful elm trees everywhere. And you see this slide shows the elm trees that are shaped like a, like a vase of flowers, right? Very graceful. And most of these elm trees have now disappeared, as we all, your, your viewers all know this, with Dutch elm disease. They're all pretty much gone, except for some solitary, isolated ones out in the field that haven't been, you know, uh, uh, tainted by it. So my mom describes these graceful, sweeping trees all, all through the Quebec countryside. So uh, if you look at this home, there's nothing about it that looks like it would indicate immiseration or poverty. But what I notice when I'm going through the records is that essentially what the French Canadians were complaining about was not necessarily grinding poverty or immiseration, but, but what, they, what they were complaining about was that 
farming was not always that lucrative uh, an, an endeavor, and there w it was hard to get your hands on cash. Um, you had to make your own clothes. Uh, often, often, the far often these people had to weave their own. Like in the 19th century, in the early 19th century, French Canadian women would weave their own cloth using their own sheep's wool, and you know, sort of they would live sort of in a kind of self reliant, autonomous way whereby they wouldn't purchase very much. They would live off the land, literally. Make their own clothes, grow their own food, have large gardens that they would then, you know, use, use the, the, the things they grow. They would can them, preserve them in different ways. So people lived relatively well, but they didn't have access to cash and to ready-made goods, um, to sort of factory, factory-made goods. Um, so, so it wasn't always a case of grinding poverty. So what it might have been a case of was that by moving to the United States, you simply had an easier life. Um, living in an industrial town, you could, if your children all worked, um, I mean, you worked very hard, but you also worked very hard on the farm, and you didn't always get a profit. You could have a bad, cr bad year. Weather sure. could be bad. The crops could fail. Uh, you could, you know, so, so, so. E eventually, eventually, when French Canadians learned of the opportunities in the industrializing cities of New England and upstate New York, and they heard through word of mouth by people coming back and forth, as Calvin pointed out, people who went back and forth brought back news about how much employment was available and how good life was, and how the cities had gas lamps in the streets, and you know there was mo there was moving pictures and something to do, uh, you know, on a, on a, on a s uh, Sunday afternoon. So people got word of mouth that there was opportunity to the South. And here, here's another really fascinating aspect of this whole migration movement. And this is kind of a little bit kind of uh, hard to conceptualize. That at the same time that Quebec was almost bleeding, it was losing all of its population to the United States, Quebec was at the same time also attracting immigrants from Europe. Mm. That, you know, uh, Italian migrants were coming to, to, to actually migrants from all over Europe, because Quebec City was the arrival before the age of railways, uh, sorry, not railways, before the, air, the, before the age of um, the air, air, line, air, air transportation, people came by boat, by uh, ocean line or, or, or ship, and they would get off at Quebec, and that was the port of entry for Canada. They'd get off at Quebec, and then from there they'd take a train and go you know, further south or further west. So, you know, uh, migrants from all over Europe were arriving in, arriving in Quebec. So how strange is that? Here's a society that at the same time is a, sort of expelling its own people, but then attracting people from Europe. You know, <laughs> how, do you, how do you make sense of that? So what I think was going on is that the immigrants coming from, let's say, southern Italy were moving to, uh, to Canada. They were probably getting jobs in Montreal in specialized areas like building railways. And People in, and, and, and that was their migratory network, but people in rural Quebec didn't hear about those opportunities maybe in the railways in Montreal. They heard about the opportunities on, you know, in, in places like Plattsburgh or Keysville or Cohoes or Glens Falls. So there was a different migratory network for the French people than there was from, you know, the, there was a transatlantic migratory network that worked one way, and then there was a kind of local migratory network involving the French Canadians that worked towards them migrating south. So, uh, so poverty was not, uh, so, uh, so obviously there's a whole range of this, but there's a range of, you know, uh, of experiences, but by and large, uh, I sort of want to give this sense to your viewers that French Canadians moved to the United States because it was a logical strategy for them at a certain time in their life and that they weren't necessarily fleeing absolute immiseration, although in some, t in some cases uh, that could indeed be the case. So I'm just going to stand up and get my little uh, slide changer here. So Calvin's going to see me go, go <laughs> through the picture. Uh, yeah, we have uh, to show everything yeah. now. Uh, um, however, oh, uh, look at this great house. This is a great house. However, I did want to sort of point out, and I, I hope your viewers can see this, that uh, in some cases there was absolute immiseration and poverty. And what we're looking at here is um, a house in rural New Brunswick. Um, and another w little known aspect of this migratory phenomenon is that there were also French Canadians living in New Brunswick, but they were known as Acadians. And this is a, a different population than the French in Quebec. Uh, 
The Acadians uh, settled initially uh, uh, where uh, present-day Nova Scotia is. They, were dep they, they came from a different part of France, from the southwest. Uh, they came from the southeast of France rather than the northwest. They spoke a different kind of French, and they considered themselves to be sort of a separate group from Quebec. And uh, they were known as Acadians. And in 1755, the British authorities deported them sort of ethnically cleansed uh, that area to open it up to British settlement, and they were deported. Uh, and it was known as, it was known as uh, le, le Grand Dérangement, the Great Derangement, or the Great Change. So many of these Acadians ended up in Louisiana, and these are the Cajuns of Louisiana. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so some of those Cajuns, uh, well, ultimately they found their way back, and when they came back, their lands in Nova Scotia had been taken up by British settlers, so they ended up settling in New Brunswick. So this is an Acadian uh, farms, farmhouse uh, in rural New Brunswick. And these people, uh, these people did have a very hard life because rural New Brunswick, the land is not that good. So many of these Acadians ended up migrating to the United States, only they ended up in northern Maine. So uh, sort of a separate group. And people refer to these people as, the, uh, sometimes they had a nickname for them, they would just call them patats which meant potatoes or yeah. potato eaters. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So when we look at this image, this is an image taken from an absolutely wonderful book, uh, which is a book about, it's a picture book, which is called Acadian Hard Times. And it was, it was the, federal, the Federal Writers Project also had uh, photographers going out during the Depression, taking pictures of ordinary people uh, in hard times. Uh, and so this is, uh, this shows us, can you see the little girl standing oh, in front yes. there? Yeah. So uh, I think I see a chicken. You see a chicken in the yeah. foreground and maybe some other things in the foreground. But you can see it looks like there's broken windows or I, I don't, it, um, I, it's kind of like a ramshackle, like almost a shack. Uh, and it doesn't give you a sense of well-being like the previous slide does. So in, in some cases, like in this one, people were fleeing you know, an absolute lack of money and opportunity and prosperity. So we can kind of understand why they would have ended up south of the border. Um, the other alternative to leaving, uh, the alternative to migrating to industrial towns of the United States was to engage in something that the government really wanted Quebecers to do, and that was called colonization. And we, I talked about this in a previous uh, uh, show. Uh, essentially, another option was to move to a more remote part of Quebec that hadn't been open to settlement yet, um, either the the Ottawa, the Ottawa River Valley, uh, the Saguenay region, or the eastern town, you know, the more remote parts of the eastern townships. And as this, this is a 19th century image from a 19th century newspaper, and what it shows you is essentially what you, what your, what the alternative was to go live in the woods, build yourself a little shack or a little log cabin, cut down trees. You can see in the slide that there's a fence around there's a fence around a little parcel of land, probably to keep the wild animals out of, out of, out of the parcel. So you'd have a, maybe a little garden there and grow some potatoes. And it would take about two years for you to get to this point, uh, where you'd have a little clearing. Uh, and you're doing this at a time, look, you can see there's a, a horse drawn, uh, horse there that's drawing, he, he's, in a, uh, he's either in a pen or he's got some kind of thing uh, harnessed to him. So you're working with ver very simple tools. You have no dynamite. You have no machinery to help you do this. It's backbreaking labor. There's mosquitoes. There's uh, there's black flies, uh, and there's nothing to do. You're in absolute what's the word? Un un unbelievable isolation. And we we talked about this earlier. So frequently. Uh, Frequently, young families would make a go of this, and after a few years, they would just give up and migrate to the United States, um, and it wouldn't really work out. So, uh, so a lot of places that weren't really uh, suitable for agriculture were opened up in the vain hope of keeping people in Canada. So the colonization movement was organized by the government of Quebec in a kind of desperate attempt to keep people from leaving. Because if French Canadians left Quebec in, in really large numbers, that meant that Quebec would lose power within Canada. Because the less people you had, the less votes you had, the less, the less representatives you had in the House of Commons in Ottawa. So this demographic loss had political re re repercussions, that French Canadians that were already a minority in Canada were becoming an even smaller minority. 
So there was this real, a very strong movement uh, um, that was ongoing throughout, it sort of went through like fits and stages throughout the latter part of the 19th century um, to try to de uh, um, desperately keep people on the soil. There was even a movement in the 1870s to get French Canadians to come back. They, they called that repatriation. Mm -hmm. So the government was so serious about not only keeping people at home, but trying to win them back from, from uh, win them back from their lives in the United States. So what do you expect? What do you expect was the, what was the result of this movement to try? In 1873, there was a depression. 1873-74, uh, there was a recession, a, a global recession where people were put out of work everywhere, north and south of the border. And you, what's the, the, the outcome is foreseeable. That nobody wanted to come back. I mean, once you had lived in an industrial town with, with its gas lighting and its stores with all kinds and cash wages that you could earn, there was no way you'd come back to, to this kind of a situation. Yeah. yeah. So it was a, it was a kind of, um, I don't know, it was a well, well intended but uh, uh, sort of. I guess an unfortunate mistake. Uh, not a mistake, but um, you know, it, it was a failure, to, to the idea of bringing them back. Um, another thing that could lead people to leave uh, was ca ca catastrophe or catastrophic fires. And when you read the newspapers in the 19th century, which I've done uh, a, very, a lot of, uh, when you read the newspapers, you notice that one of the things people lived in, in absolute fear of was fire. Sure, the city of Plattsburgh virtually burned down at least twice during the 1800s. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, you can try to imagine they didn't have those little electric, like warning, like alarms like we have, right? Smoke alarms. Smoke alarms, and people's houses usually had fireplaces or wood stoves in them, and you know the houses were made of wood and they were they were insulated with wood chips. They were like tinder boxes, so people, you know. People lived in fear of dying in a fire, and fires were uh, kind of a commonplace, uh, a commonplace event. So what we see in this, this is actually from a 19th century newspaper uh, uh, of Quebec, and as I was doing my doctoral research, I'd have to scroll through endless reels of this stuff on microfilm, and every once in a while there'd be a catastrophic fire in the Richelieu Valley in places like Saint-Jean, and uh, it kind of shows you what happens, look, you see how the whole town has burnt down, and <coughs> the, bottom, the bottom slide shows you that all that's li left is the fireplaces uh, made of brick, and everything else that's wood has just been reduced to rubble. And frequently, when things like this happen, people just say, well, rather than rebuild, we'll just move, move. we'll just go, you know, s go south. Uh, so, uh, so catastrophic events like crop failures or fires could also spur, uh, spur departures uh, to the United States. And one of the things that uh, really turned this migration into a mass phenomenon was the building of railways. And here again is an illustration from a 19th century newspaper showing the early sort of rudimentary locomotives that existed in Quebec. And the, the, the railways allowed, as I said in an earlier, uh, an earlier segment, it allowed people to li leave on a kind of, uh, it made transportation uh, quicker and more reliable. People left on a kind of a routine sort of regular schedule. So, uh, so the earliest railways allowed masses of people to move around, uh, and so rather than moving on with, a, with a, a horse and a wagon or taking a small boat on Lake Champlain, these railways could now get you uh, across the border in a much, uh, much faster time. And the railways had the advantage of working uh, 12 months out of the year. You could put a big snow plow on the front and blast your way through. So for Canada, where the winters are long and harsh, or at least they were in the 19th century, uh, this was a tremendous technological uh, innov innovation. And uh, here's, a, here's an interesting, uh, interesting, I have to sort of turn this around. Here's an interesting slide that, this is actually a caricature uh, that I found. It's a really rudimentary uh, drawing uh, that was, in a, that was in a Montreal newspaper, and I have to go backward in order to show it to you. Uh, let me see if I can get it straight. I, it's always hard to, it's hard to sort of get this right. Yeah, I just want to make sure that I have, yeah, make sure that I have it right. Yeah, so what, what you see here, I, I, I think this is a very interesting image. It's not a very well done uh, caricature or slide, but um, it shows a train station um, and we're not sure which train station it was. They don't really tell you. So this isn't, this isn't the work of a sort of professional artist. Uh, 
But the inscription at the bottom is an interesting one. Uh, if you can read it, see, you, you can tell it's almost handmade because the inscription is not even, uh, it's not even regular, it's just written in there. And so it shows people leaving. You can see a man in the middle, he has like suitcases and a little child in the, in the bottom uh, right-hand corner. And it says, surchargé et taxé, et ne, peu, ne, ne pouvant vendre leurs produits, ils partent pour les États-Unis, right? So it's essentially the, the translation of that would be surcharged and taxed, overly taxed, and not being able to sell their products, they leave for the United States. So maybe it was kind of a political cartoon or something of the day. I think it was. Yeah. I think it was saying that life in Canada, actually Canadians still do pay more taxes, don't yeah. they? <laughs> if you go to Canada, you notice they have something called the GST, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, your viewers might, might know what that is. It's the goods and service tax. Sure. So Canadian government has balanced, it has, it, has, it has balanced its budget, but on the backs of taxpayers. Um, you, have, you, have a, you have a provincial sales tax and then a federal sales tax, and in all, P Canadians pay 15% tax on everything from haircuts to funerals. So Canadians are overtaxed. Maybe that's why they come to Plattsburgh Gee, to shop. That? And New Yorkers have been saying the same thing for a long time. <laughs> Well, they have it pretty easy compared to Canadians. <laughs> Imagine paying 15%. Yeah. So maybe, I mean, I, some, I, I give my students this article that, that, that says that when people from Quebec come to shop in Plattsburgh, it's a form of a tax revolt. It's a shopping cart rebellion. That's shopping what it's called. Rebellion. Yeah. Very good. That, you know, you come here and, you know, you don't, you don't get gouged as, as, as heavily as you might in Quebec. So how interesting to see that this is, this is in the, the 19th century and they're saying that people are overly taxed, can't, can't make a living in Canada and are moving to the United States. So, so what's interesting from this is we, we can see how, uh, the, the, you know, I found when I looked at these newspapers that people were extremely aware of this. Of this. People knew that, that Quebec was losing its population to the United States. It was a sort of a widely recognized problem or phenomenon. So, a kind of early cartoon showing people leaving in great numbers and not surprisingly they're taking a train uh, in order to do that. Uh, so here's another interesting slide that uh, I hope your viewers can see very uh, well that this slide shows us railways in Canada in 1860. So the earliest railways to be built uh, before the great transcontinental railway, the CPR, the Canadian Pacific Railway. And what I want to call your attention to, and it's very hard to see, uh, is the, there's a mauve line connecting Toronto to uh, Rivière du Loup. Can you see the mauve mm -hmm. line? Mm -hmm. And the mauve line there is the sort of first substantial railway of Canada, and it was called the Grand Trunk Railway. You can see on, on the key, uh, the, the, mo the mauve line next to it, it says the Grand Trunk Railway. Connected Quebec City to uh, Toronto and even actually goes as far as Sarnia, Ontario, and actually connects up with Detroit, if you can see well enough. It's hard to see it. But so here's what's so interesting. This is a kind of, you know, intercolonial railway because Canada doesn't exist yet. These are still sort of separate colonies. So it's linking Quebec with Toronto. But the most important thing I want you to notice is, how, check it out that the Grand Trunk Railway actually has a little kind of feeder line that goes down to Portland. Mm -hmm. In order to have an ice-free port, they had it go down to Portland. So the irony was, here was this railway that was supposed to connect Canadians and keep them together, but that southern, the southern one leading into the States uh, allowed, allowed people from the Montreal area to sort of get, get down to uh, the industrial towns of Maine a lot easier than they used to before. So. The railway, at the building of these railways actually, rather than keep people tra traveling within Canada, allowed them to travel into the United States. So a lot of the French Canadians that ended up in places like Lewiston, Maine, took a Canadian railway to get there. So it's kind of interesting that a Canadian railway would lead them uh, further south into the United States. And this slide I like to show because it, it, sh it, it demonstrates something which I think is significant to the North Country community. And what we're looking at here is the La Lake Champlain Valley, um, only we're looking at the Vermont side. And when I put together this, this slideshow was put together before I moved to the North Country. There's probably an equally uh, important image of the uh, uh, Delaware and Hudson Railway. But what we notice, I mean, the reason I put this, this, this image in, in this uh, presentation is 
If you go from Montreal or the south shore of Quebec, you notice how the railway goes to the Mississauga uh, Bay, and then it kind of bifurcates and leads to all kinds of uh, southern destinations. So here's my theory about how the migration worked for the North Country. Up until the time these railways were built, the people who wanted to move to the States basically came along the Richelieu River either in boats or else they came on horse and buggy or else they crossed from Hemingford into Champlain, as Calvin said. They, you know, it's not far to get from Heming Hemingford to Champlain or even Hemingford to, to Plattsburgh. So the earliest migration, because it was limited in terms of transportation, the earliest migration was essentially a borderland phenomenon. But as railways were built later in the 1860s and 70s, this allowed the same people now to take a train and the train would lead them to southern destinations, southern mill towns, uh, places like Lowell, Massachusetts or Springfield. One of the southernmost destinations there is Springfield, Massachusetts or Albany or uh, Point South. So the building of railways allowed the excess population of Quebec to go beyond places like Plattsburgh and go to even more opportunity further south. And, and the historical statistics actually bear this out, that the French Canadian, the level of migration to this community was extremely high in the 1840s, the 1850s, and the 1860s, and then later it, it sort of gradually declines over time. So we got the migrants first, but eventually uh, we ended up losing them for points further south. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing to note. So we, we, we had the earliest communities, uh, but perhaps there were uh, even more opportunity in places uh, like, I don't know, Woonsocket, uh, Fall River, Lowell, Massachusetts, Spencer, Massachusetts, uh, uh, Lewiston, Maine, uh, places where they had uh, perhaps even larger factories, larger employers, more opportunity. So the Delaware and Hudson Railway that, was, that came through our community would allow Plattsburgh to be a kind of just one stop on, in a much longer potential commute. It gave people more choice as to where to go. You could get off in Plattsburgh or you could get off further south. You could make it down to Cohoes or you could, you could you know, take another route and end up somewhere else. Uh, and the Northway does the same thing today. <laughs> Absolutely, of course it does. It, it sort of, yes, it did, it, it did the same thing that the building of the Northway did in the 1960s, which is that it kind of blew, it sort of, it sort of exploded the potential for, for, for movement of population um, for like rapid, and, it, and, it, and it, it sort of allowed people to bypass places more easily. Like now when you take the highway, you bypass everything. You don't see anything. You don't see uh, what lies in between. So uh, here's an ad uh, for the Vermont Central Railway and Lake Champlain steamers. Mm -hmm. So I like that. Isn't that interesting? Beautiful. Yeah, it says Lake George and Minnehaha. So interestingly that, you know. The Minnehaha still plies Lake George today. Is, isn't it a gourmet, yeah. gourmet dining experience? Oh, yeah. Is that, well, yeah. It's a stern wheeler, it's beautiful. I thought I, s it wasn't it on the, the, the uh, Adirondack roadside recipes show? Oh, could be. Oh, I think, I think <laughs> it might have been. I but, should have guessed that might be a favorite of yours as it is of mine. Oh, dear, <laughs> oh dear. yeah. Well, here's what's so fascinating is that, I mean, it, the, the first, like, the, the, here was the idea that you had steam power and steam power allowed for uh, steam boats on Lake Champlain, but you use the same kind of power and you harness, up, you harness it up to an iron horse and you have railways. Sure. So you notice that under Lake George, there's a little rail, a little like locomotive with some ca like ca cabins attached to it. And below it, you have a steamboat, the, Minaha the Minnehaha. So here it says, summer arrangements of 1857. So this is the real earlier, earliest times, pleasure and business travel. So pleasure and business could mean you're leaving for a vacation, could mean you're leaving for business or for work. Uh, two, th thir two through trains and two boats a day. You get through in one day. And then it, it, sort, of tells you, it sort of tells you where the various departures are. And if you read this, it says uh, something about Lake Champlain. I can't even read it myself. But if we look at the uh, various departures, I wish I could. I wish we could go up closer and actually read it, because it'll tell you names like Rouse's Point, all the kind of stops that you can make around Lake Champlain, and it actually allowed you to go 
You could take a steamer from Montreal up the, up, up the St. Lawrence, down the Richelieu River, and then get off at Rouse's Point, and then get on a train and go further south. Or, you know, so there was a, a so you could combine the steamboat with the steam railway uh, to make for a, a, a longer trip. Interesting thing at the bottom right hand corner, it says Paul Mondu is the agent that you should contact. So even though it was the Vermont Central, it had a French speaking agent. So you bought your tickets with someone who spoke French because, uh, so, because you know, it's so interesting that in terms of transportation, the Lake Champlain region was connected by steamship, at least initially by steamboat. The Vermont Central steamboats, which are you know uh, the, the Lake Champlain steamboats that we see today, they went up as far as you know Montreal. They went up through, up to Quebec, and you know they went. There was no reason why they couldn't, uh, because there was canals on the Richelieu that allowed them to do that. So you know we try to think of the Lake Champlain basin as a migratory network, and having you know these possibilities for transportation. So this would have been an ad that would have appeared in a Montreal newspaper or a. A, a newspaper from Saint Hyacinthe, which is on the on the south south shore uh, of Montreal, uh, and it tells you what to, you know where you can go. There's a night express too. How interesting is that? Uh, right. So this is what the interior of such a train would have looked like. Uh, uh -huh. and isn't that great? Isn't that great? It looks as if they have some kind of reclining seats that can be turned into beds. So uh, again, an illustration from a 19th century newspaper shows you the early migrant trains. Little shells. That's beautiful. That's yeah. the red eye, huh? That's the red eye. See, the man on the left is kind of sleeping. He has a, some kind of like, he has like a parcel with his belongings wrapped in it. And behind him, you see a lady who's leaning on her husband's shoulder. So this, is the, this would be the, the Midnight Express, or the, yeah, the, the, the red eye, exactly, as you said. So uh, emigration, uh, increasingly as the century wore on, emigration from Quebec was a question of getting on what they called the cars. In French, they called them les chars, which meant the train cars or the moving cars. So uh, aller prendre les chars was, you know, was the way, was the way that they, they spoke of it. And there were accidents, really freak. There were spectacular accidents because railways were not as reliable in those days as they are t uh, today. So there was off often horrific, um, horrific uh, catastrophes. Right, so here's just an, uh, an image from, a, uh, again, a 19th century newspaper. This is L'Opinion Publique, the public opinion, and it shows the kind of railway station that many French Canadian uh, farmers would have left at. So was, you know, the railways linked up the small remote places to much more central places. Making, uh, making transportation a much less problematic uh, matter. And now we get to the most in interesting part of my presentation, and that has to do with material culture. Um, so I want your viewers to look here at the image of the man on the right, and not so much on the left, because the left is the early 19th century, the right is sort of the 1830s. And the man on the right is a habitant, uh, or he's dressed à la façon du pays, or he's dressed in the fashion of the country. And what he's wearing is a coat made of homespun. Um, and homespun was, uh, in Quebec, they called this stuff étoffe du pays. Uh, and on the, on the right-hand screen there, I have the word so your viewers can see it. Uh, it was so well known and so widely produced that it had a name. They called it étoffe du pays, which is another word for thick cloth of the country or coarse cloth of the country. We would call that today homespun. And what this, it was called homespun or, or it was called this because it was basically cloth that was made from scratch. Using the wool of your own sheep, you would, you know, shave, you, you know, you'd, uh, what's the word? How you Here. Say? Thank you, yes, I knew it wasn't shave. You'd shear, you'd shear the Close. sheep. Close, yeah. Shear the sheep uh, and this, you know, process the wool into yarn with a spinning wheel and then weave that on a primitive spinning loom. And then you'd make garments with that homespun. And it re the result was a kind of uh, nubbly kind of, a nubbly kind of coarse cloth uh, that had a kind of strange texture and strange color. And I brought in today a big piece of homespun this is actually a, a blanket that was bought uh, at an auction um, in Quebec. My mother bought this. She gave it to me because I loved it. 
it's beautiful. And I sort really of want to show, oh, I really want to show it. So, so if you look at it, oh, yeah. right, so this is, this is homespun. This was made by a French Canadian farm, farm wife. Nubbly it is too. Is it, it's nubbly. <laughs> yeah. it's, it. like, it's a bit like burlap, or it's, yeah. it's got, but it's nubbly, but it's 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 wool. It's soft, and you can kind of see the little white, the warp and the woof. Oh, sure. White. You can see the white threads that don't look like wool, but then what's crossing it is wool, and you see the. It's got like sort of pink in it and brown and different colors, and uh, and so this is homespun, and so this this jacket that you see the man wearing would be made of something not uh, not unlike this. And the reason I wanted your viewers to see it is not just to see an actual <coughs> piece of it, but have a look at, have a look at like the stitching on it that it's made by hand. Oh sure. And you see that it, it's been seamed together. So I kind of want to show this to your viewers that have, it's two pieces that have been sewn together, and each piece is about as wide as a woman's arms. About a yard. Because it was woven on mm -hmm. a small, a small. Uh, loom and back it was and forth, back really. and forth right so it couldn't be any wider than a human arm mm -hmm. so we're talking about sort of handicraft production in people's homes this is not mass produced right it's built in someone's home or built in someone's home it's woven in someone's home probably in the in the long winter months uh, when there wasn't much to do in the farm or in the you know in the evening so in the early evening so, and then it's sewn together. So you couldn't have a proper blanket that was like we have them today. Our blankets are factory made, right? They're one big wide thing. They're produced on a loom. On a loom. So, so basically, we're, show, we're, we're noting that this is handicraft production. So this is how the people of Quebec lived. They lived very modestly, very simply. They lived off of things that they could make themselves. It's a, it's a warm blanket, but, but maybe on a cold night you need quite a few of these, right? Because it's probably not warm enough. So before we, before we go on, I also want to show you another artifact that I brought in for your viewers on the same theme, and that's this chair. I love it. Isn't yeah. it beautiful? Isn't it beautiful? It is stunning. It's stunning. Yeah. And I think there's a lot... Okay, why don't we, why don't we, why don't we sort of do sure. a little... Why don't we do a little, uh, like, sort of... Uh, expose on this chair. So this is a chair. Uh, this is a chair that you would see everywhere in Quebec. You'll see chairs like this. This is a. This is a. What, what do you call this? Um, a habitant chair. Pretty much every farmer in Quebec in the 19th century could make such a chair. His father would have taught him how to make it. So what do you notice about the chair? That's different. Have you ever seen a chair like this before? Oh yes, you I have. have a couple at home. Have you got a couple like I, this at I home? I love them and, they, and you're right, they are sturdy. This is really, really thick stuff on here. You, anyone can sit on this. This is, this is like, this is... Well, almost anyway. Oh, we'll, we'll have you sit on it. In a <laughs> <laughs> we'll have you sit on it. But can you see how, can you see how that, that this is a piece of wood and it's not very regular, right? It's a branch, no. right? So it's been whittled, right? Can you see how the seams here have been whittled down to fit into the hole. Well, of course. So some man, some French Canadian habitant shaved, shaved it. And very often these would be wear down from the heels of worn down from the heels of people who sat on them. The many people and who sat on them. Right. right. So he whittled it down so it would fit fit into this little hole. Sure. He didn't and we even make it on a lathe, so that's no, why it's exactly. irregular. No, exactly. That's why it's all irregular. Hand, so sure. this is all made by hand and and there are no nails here used for this. This is all just put in really tight, right? Yep, really, pegs, really yep. tight. Nail, yeah, there's little small pegs. And there's a couple of old nails here. So you see here that this is not regular eye. This one doesn't look like this one. It's kind of, it's kind of irregular. And uh, what else? This, the side here is all sort of put in really, really tightly. And this is a really, really solid, it's, it's solid it's chair. Amazing. It's yeah. an amazingly solid chair. It's also aesthetically very beautiful. Because if you look at the chair, look at how it goes inward here, mm -hmm. right? But the, the guy who made it, the builder, he made it sort of fan out this way, not just be like a kind of, you know, mm -hmm. like just, he, he, it, has a kind of, it has a kind of pleasing dimension to it. There's another aspect. If you have a really large family with lots of chairs around the table, the chair is also extremely lightweight. Mm -hmm. It's featherweight, right? So... You could hook it up onto the onto this wall and then wash the floor and then put it back. So it was easy to store and easy to stack, and extremely 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 light. There's one final thing that I want to point out. What else do you notice about this chair that is 
It's on a table, so it might not really show, but what else do you notice about it? Ooh. There's something else. Well, what's this made of? What's the seat made of? Is that? I don't know if it's leather. It's bark. Or bark. It is bark. Yeah. It's strips of bark that have been probably soaked and then cured, like sort of cured and then just... Very thick, though. Very, very, very extremely thick. thick. Very th yeah, very thick. But some amount of skill went into that. So can you see the bottom of it, that it is bark? Oh, sure. Yeah. No, you can't. Sure. Yeah. So there's a sort of pattern of the weaving that's aesthetically pleasing. It's mm -hmm. not it's not a mess, right? So this is a this is a very old chair. This is about a hundred years old, and it'll it'll always be oh, sturdy. Yeah. yeah, I love it. So everyone in Quebec has seen these these chairs are a dime are a dime a dozen. You'll find them all over Quebec. But there's one final thing that you haven't noticed about this chair that's kind of unusual. And maybe what we should do is maybe what we should do in order for you to notice it is this. Calvin has it. Look low. how small it is. Yeah. This is not a child's chair. This is a regular chair. But look how look it only goes like yeah, it's very low. small. It is very low. Yeah. Perhaps we can conclude that our ancestors were smaller than we were, or I don't know. It's an interesting interesting question. That it's not very big. Well, you know, I have a number of old chairs at home, and very often the legs just wore down. That isn't the case with this chair. I think it, it probably didn't wear down that much. It, it probably didn't wear but down I think that it was much. it was short. I don't know if they had um, if it was not if it was meant it could be it could have been meant for spinning, in which case they were right there. Um, the t most of the tables were higher than that, so I I don't know. Maybe it, the, maybe the man made the table to measure and it wasn't that high. Or maybe this was made for a lot for a sugar shack. Who knows? But it is small. Yeah. By our by our standards, it's a small chair. But I have a feeling it wasn't made for children. It was made for. I'm I'm quite sure you're right. Yeah. It was made for regular people. Yeah. So that's interesting. So these are the kinds of so what what we can get out of looking at this homespun, and looking at the chair is that that the habitant had good land. The habitant could eat off of his land. Could actually make his own furniture. So most French Canadians were known for their wood carving uh, abilities. It was just passed on through the generations. Um, if you go to Notre Dame Basilica in Montreal, you see the fantastic oh, wood carving yes. there is oh, there. My. So there's this real tradition of just, you know, everyone has the ability to do this. It's passed on, you know, from your father. And, you know, you spend those long Canadian winter nights uh, carving by the wood stove or putting together, you know, furniture for your family. But, you have, but I think these artifacts are worth looking at because what they tell us about is how hard life was for people in those days. I mean, if we want a chair today, we, we, you know, we go up to, we go to J.C. Penney or we go to some store and we order one or, you know, it's easy for us to do it. But in those days, people were living off of the land. The wood probably came from the farmer's own, own forest um, and the wool came from his own sheep. So people had a certain level of comfort, but they were living with kind of, a kind of a, what we would consider a kind of a primitive life, you know, mm -hmm. not that sophisticated. So let's go back to our habitant with his homespun. Um, and now that we know what homespun looks like, we get a good sense of it. So he's wearing a handmade homespun coat, a la Canadienne. He has moccasins on. He's wearing, a, of course, you put a hood on the coat because it's Canada, right? You need, to, you need to keep warm in the winter. So he, he has uh, hand-knitted gloves, and he has probably a toque on underneath that for extra warmth. I also want to point out to you that he's wearing this a belt, a sash, which is brightly, brightly woven out of wool, and it's, the main color in it is red. And that's called, uh, in French, they call that a ceinture fléchée, which means an arrow belt. Because the pattern in the weaving was a pattern like oh, an arrow. Oh, yes. Yeah, I and, never heard that before. Yeah. I like that. And you wrap that, you'd wrap that around your waist twice and then make a knot in it to hold the coat together and to keep warm. And uh, I read somewhere that these saint sur fleche the real ones, nowadays they make imitation ones for tourists, right? Yeah. And they're, they're kind of cheap and narrow. They don't look like the real thing. But the real, the real sort of, uh, the real ones that were made in the 19th century were really thick and really wide. And when they, men wrapped them around their waist, they served as a kind of a, almost like a girdle, so that if you're carrying heavy loads, it sort of gives you some support for your, for your torso. So he's wearing the saint sur fleche It doesn't really show up in the photo because it's black and white. You don't really see that it's, it's a red belt. So this was actually the national costume of the French Canadian habitant. Oh. Right? Great revelations. Yes. Sir. I love it. Yes. That, that, you know, that this is part of the folklore of, of French Canada. 
that, you know, that they dress differently, right? Every culture has its own kind of, you know, vestimentary traditions or has its own kind of, um, you know, uh, sort of way of, 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 of looking. And so the moccasins were borrowed from the native people. They were handmade. Once again, the moccasins were handmade, hand sewn and uh, put together by the habitants. So this was the national costume. And uh, during the rebellions, uh, when the French Canadians rebelled against the British in 1837, there was a big movement to not wear any imported clothes and to wear this and to not have to buy anything from the British merchants. Right? So there was a kind of political subtext to dressing this way. It was a way of saying, uh, you know, I don't want to have to give my money over to the, the British who conquered me. So here we have the habitant wearing the étoffe du pays. Uh, and in Quebec, this was a familiar sight. But if you went to New England, you'd look kind of strange if you were dressed this way. Um, so, all right, so I, I want to go back to my original point. So I think these artifacts, they might give us clues as to why people moved to places like Plattsburgh, why people moved to the United States. They had blankets, they had chairs, they weren't in absolute dire like necessity. They had the sort of basic things of life, but what they didn't have was much comfort. And they didn't have access to manufactured goods. They didn't have any money to spend. They had to make everything themselves. Yeah. My, my grandmother made clothes from, for her children. Uh, my mom said she would order pa uh, patterns from Paris and would make clothes. And she'd, re she'd take old coats and she'd cut them up and make coats for her children out of used clothing. And my mom. And, the, and yeah. out of flour sacks and out of whatever they whatever had. Whatever they had, yeah. And, um, my mom said that her mother even sewed fur coats. She'd buy pelts and make fur coats for her daughters. Wow. Can you, that's kind of amazing. Yeah, it it's, it's, it, yeah. And, yeah. And we still have some of the clothes that, that my grandmother made for my mother, and you know, they're uh, beautifully made. Um, so uh, so people, people weren't necessarily uh, having har a hard, you know, they weren't starving, but they weren't perhaps, they weren't having m m many luxuries. So what I think happened um, in the farms of Quebec is overpopulation, and not, not enough land, but essentially people didn't have any cash. They didn't have money. And when you went to, to the United States and worked in a factory, you made a little envelope of money. Every, you know, every week you'd get your paycheck, and you, know, you got a regular paycheck, which is what really attracted them. And with it, you could buy, uh, you could maybe stop wearing homespun and wear something a little bit more fashionable. So here's an image of uh, an Acadian woman at her loom. And I, wanted, I like the image because it shows us, look at what she's sitting on. It's like a log with some sticks pushed into it, and that's a bench. And you see that there's the spinning wheel in front of the loom where she was, would have spun the wool. And she's sitting at her loom on the second floor of her house, and she's probably uh, weaving something not unlike this étoffe du pays that I just showed you. So uh, homespun uh, was what people were obliged to make do with. Well, moving to the United States in the 19th century meant not only did you have cash, but you had something to spend it on. And here's an ad taken from a newspaper that, sh uh, sorry, it's taken from a catalog that shows you the spring and summer collections, and it shows you ladies' white shirt waists. So not only could you have a factory made or a kind of, uh, 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 you know, a factory made shirt made of woven cotton, woven in a factory, but you could have many different styles. So you had much more, uh, what's the word, choice than you would have had if you stayed back, uh, back in Quebec. So this is the idea in those days is you order things from catalogs, but the catalog illustration shows us, uh, shows us um, the kinds of new things that were available to people if you had the cash to buy them, right? But the problem was that people didn't have the cash to do that. So here's a picture of Franco-American, French-Canadian mill girls. Uh, this is taken from my family co collection. Is it really? Uh -huh. And it's not a particularly good picture because the girls' heads are kind of cut off at the top. Oh, that's great. But I, I really love it. Isn't, it, isn't it wonderful? The little girl in the front is kind of showing her, her pretty dress, right? And all the, the lace trimming on it that's made by a machine. So these girls were smartly dressed. This is what you would have called being smartly dressed. Maybe it was a Sunday, right? They're wearing their Sunday finest. And their clothes look very clean. So they're wearing, I mean, if we go back to the factory blouses or the sort of the blouses you got from the catalog, here's these young girls who would have worked in mills, maybe weaving cotton all day long, but then enjoying the fruits of their labor by being able to wear more sophisticated clothing than they would have back home. 
And my mother tells me that, and, and, and this is borne out by, by legend, that French Canadians who lived in the United States would put their Sunday best on and then go visit their folks back in Quebec, <laughs> right? I love it. Yeah. And they would, and they would drive a fan, if it was the 1930s, they'd have a fancy mm -hmm. car as well. And they drive, and they drive to, to like the rural roads of Quebec, and like like the dust would rise behind them. They you know come in in this beautiful shiny car, and they'd be wearing their beautiful <laughs> clothes. And yeah. my mom said this caused even more people to want to go and live there oh, sure. because they were impressed with you know that they they wore nice suits and they had fancy jewelry, like some kind of maybe not real jewelry, but you know God. something they bought it. Sure. Yeah, something something they bought it like at, at Woolworths, you know. Sure. So this kind of fancy clothes uh, made, life, made life better. So here's a very interesting illustration that's taken from uh, the Harper's new, new Monthly Magazine. So here's an American magazine that was commenting on the French Canadians that are coming to the United States. And it's showing uh, a habitant uh, arriving uh, in an American town. And can you see that he's wearing kind of a homespun jacket? A sash, a sash yeah. and he's got moccasins on. He's got some kind of leggings. He's, he doesn't have bare legs. That's, that's not a kilt or anything. He's, he's got some kind of leggings on, like woolen leggings. Can you see how there's a pocket missing on his coat? Mm -hmm. Where you can see where it's kind of wore, wore off around it. And he's wearing a toque, right? The toque is the national hat of Canadians, right? A woven knitted cap, a toque. Yeah. So he's wearing a toque and he, there he is with his numerous, his wife is to his left. She's carrying their latest child. He's got a uh, large family. So he's arriving and he's, uh, you know, getting some indications from the train. Uh, someone at the train station is telling him where he can go to find housing. Uh, and the purpose of the, of, the, of the illustration was to show there was this image and then the contrast was this image, 10 years later, the same family. That's the same man now and his children have grown up. And he's now wearing a suit with a, with a bowler hat, and his wife is, his wife is well, well tricked out, well, well dressed, and his daughters have grown up, and they're looking like young American girls. So much so that some, some kind of suitor is uh, lifting his hat to them and acknowledging them as upstanding American citizens. So they went from being sort of, uh, sorry, they went from being habitant, what am I doing here? I'm losing it. Gotta go back or forward. I don't know. I'm, I'm losing it here. Gotta go. <laughs> there we go. That's what I wanted to show you. So we start off with this, uh, coming from Quebec, looking like an immigrant, right? Looking like uh, some kind of rustic. And then years later, they have, their lives have improved, the standard of living has improved, and now they're, they're, the children have become Americanized. And frequently, the, the, the frequently, the, the parents would leave Quebec hoping to return someday to Quebec. Once the children grew up living in the United States and becoming accustomed to American ways, um, they, they didn't want to go back to Quebec. So that often caused a conflict between the parents and the younger, the younger generation. So have a look at the next picture, which is so very interesting. This is a picture taken, again, from my family collection. Um, so every, every, every family of Quebec that has pictures of their ancestors has pictures that come from American studios, um, from American photographers, because virtually every family in Quebec has ancestors that emigrated to the United States. Mm -hmm. As, you, know, it's, it's, it, you can take it for granted that they have uh, relatives that moved. So here's a picture which I wanted to show your viewers because it shows a French Canadian family, but more importantly, look how many teenage children there are in this picture, right? There's one, there's three boys in the back row, four, five, there's about six children here at least that could go out to work. So even though the wages were not very high, people would earn th something like 25 cents a day uh, in those days, uh, even though the wages weren't very high, if enough of your children worked, and if you pooled your resources and lived modestly, you could, you could make a, a, a decent living. So here's a picture of a French Canadian family wearing their Sunday best. Um, and you can see that the clothes they're wearing are not made of homespun, right? So that's the first thing I want you to know. Like if you look at the little girl on the left, bottom left-hand corner, she's wearing a dress with many ruffles and it's a real fancy dress, right? So, uh, so the, the, the Franco-Americans or the immigrants had a higher standard of living than their brothers and sisters back who stayed home. 
But what I find most interesting about this photograph is that it's an early 19th century photograph, a late, sorry, a late 19th century photograph. It's been colorized in a very kind of uh, amateurish way. And you pro I don't know if you can see this, but have a look at the gentleman, the father sitting in front. Can you see that he's under his waistcoat, under his jacket, can you see there's like a chain there? Probably a watch fob. It's a watch fob, but it's been colorized. Mm -hmm. It's yellow. Uh, can you see, the, look at the woman on the upper left, sorry, upper right hand corner. Can you see she has a fob or something pinned to her lapel? There's mm -hmm. like a piece of jewelry and it's been yep. colorized yellow? Yep. So it's basically interesting to see how the jewelry has been highlighted on this picture. Yeah. To, to sort of impress whoever looks upon it that they have gold jewelry on. Which kind of shows that they've arrived, right? Sure. So the, sto the stories that were told was that in rural Quebec, these people would show up at mass in a rural parish, dressed with their gold watches and all this, and they would have money in their pockets, and they'd be jingling their money and sort of showing off, right? Kind yeah. of showing how good life was back, back in the United States. And this would cause even more people to want to go to live in the United States, because look how well they were doing, right? So, uh, so large families were the ticket to prosperity, and this image shows how the Franco-Americans were obviously smart people. Because look how well they were doing, you know? They, they were, of course, as my mother would point out to me, you know, this is what they look like on the s Sunday best, you know? So she, my mom has this expression in French. Uh, she's full of this kind of folk wisdom. And, she, and the expression is, a beau mentir qui vient de loin, which is, basically says, it's easy to lie when you come from far. <laughs> I love it. Right? Of course it is. Right. Nobody can sure. check your story, right? You can, you, can come, you can come wearing all these beautiful clothes, and people think you've got a really good life going on, but maybe when you get home, you've got to put your rags back on and go to work, you know? <laughs> so maybe, maybe, all thing, yeah, maybe things are not so good. Uh, maybe things are not as good as they might appear on the surface. So these people are obviously wearing their Sunday best. That's probably not how they work. They dress every day of the year. So here's another image showing us, uh, the, this is the bourgeois family, that's actually their family name. This is the bourgeois household of Manchester, uh, of Manchester, New Hampshire, circa 1905. And it's Christmas time. And they have a Christmas tree in the background and they're arrayed around the little table. And they have f not homemade furniture, but factory made furniture turned on a, on a, on, on a machine. And we can't really see it very well, but I, I want you to try to uh, sort of focus on the man in the bottom right-hand corner is the father. And he's holding a little child between his knees, but have a look at his hand. Can you see how large his hand is mm -hmm. and how his thumb is kind of stained? Mm -hmm. Right, so he's a mill worker. And he's got some teenage daughters or older daughters that are probably working as well in the mills. Uh, but on the table is some fruit oranges, which w were a rare thing in rural Quebec, right? You've heard the story, right? Oh, sure. At Christmas, you got an orange, right? Yeah. My mother has told me this in, uh, how many times, that at Christmas, they were so thrilled because they got a stocking with an orange oh, in an it. Orange, and yeah. they, the story is that they ate that orange so slowly because yeah. it was such a rare thing. So they have store-bought food, they have a gas lamp, they have a nice Christmas tree, and in the background is a uh, photo of uh, the young St. John the Baptist, which is the patron saint of the French Canadians. So I just like to include this photo because it showed the kind of, uh, it showed the kind of um, material comfort that was available in the cities of the United States that was not so readily available in rural Quebec. So I'm trying to make a case that, uh, that people uh, migrated to the United States because it offered uh, a higher level of material comfort. There's wallpaper on the walls. Uh, for all intents and purposes, this is a happy, joyful uh, family scene. But once again, this is Christmas time, right? It's not, it's not it might not be typical. <coughs> might, it might not be typical. So maybe what I'll do is just take a pause here and, uh, and then we'll, uh, I'll have a, I'll, I'm gonna check my slides and make sure that they're all in the right direction because it looks like they might not be. So why don't we have a little pause? We'll do that. And we're underway one more time. Yeah. <laughs> the slide is 
This light is miraculously turned around. <laughs> exactly, we got it. We got it turned around. It. Just you know, just just because it's kind of important, so that you can see that it, it is indeed what I'm telling you. It is. Yeah. Now it says at the bottom, interior de la résidence bourgeois à Manchester. Um, so, yeah. So the, a kind of a higher level of material comfort. That looks better somehow too. Turned around. It seems to make more sense. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It looks way way better. Yeah. So a happy family scene. I think one of the ladies is unpeeling an orange. Okay, okay so we're just going to continue no, here. No, no, is no. she? Not unpeeling. She's just showing it. Peeling. She's peeling it. What, oh, did I say unpeeling it? Oh, that, that's my that's my French coming that's out. It's like my favorite phrase. Uh -huh. uh, we're unthawing the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> unpeeling it. Yeah. I love it. Bad bad language. That's 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 Canadian. That's that's what happens when you when you think in French and speak in English. <laughs> Gee, she's oh. human. I'm human. I make mistakes. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, um, so let's let's. I want to show you uh, this picture because it's a very beautiful picture. But I wanted to kind of uh, make make a contrast uh, with Plattsburgh, uh, because what happened? I think in you remember the slide we saw of the Vermont Central Railway sweeping down into the southern parts of New England. What happened in, state, in states like Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Maine, where all the rivers were sort of powering down uh, toward the Atlantic Ocean? So those rivers were same like the Saranac here. Uh, if you, you know, mo most towns, if you look, usually have a river going through them because that's where they set up the mills and they used early, like early water power to power the mills. So here we have the Saranac River uh, in Plattsburgh, but m so most industrial towns in New England were situated close to some river. Um, and so what, what happened in, in the sort of southern New England was you had the growth of very large factories in towns like Lewiston, Maine, Lowell, Massachusetts, Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Uh, they became industrial towns where you had one or two, three large factories that sort of dominated the, the employment scene. And what we see in, the, in, the, in, in this, this is actually the little Canada of Lewiston, Maine. So these French, can, because the workers live close to the factories, the residential neighborhood would be right next to the factory. And because most of the workers were French Canadian, this area next to the factory came to be known as the so-called Petit Canada, or Little Canada, a mini Canada, right? Uh, sort of a home away from home. And in those southern industrial towns, the little Canada would be relatively proximate to the factory. So that big black box in the background there is, is one of the mills. And right next to it, you see tenement houses, right? These large blocks that house the industrial workers that went into the factories. And you see there's a, there's a church steeple there, and that would be the Franco-American parish. So here is the, 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 the little Canada of Lewiston, Maine. And it's really easy to recognize. Um, because, because of the way the buildings are uh, and because it's close to the factory, it's really recognizable. And I argue, I'm, I'm going to argue that for in Plattsburgh, we do have a little Canada, but it's not necessarily located next to one big factory. And that might just be a reflection of the fact that there was a, maybe a lot of small scale uh, places of employment scattered throughout the city and so there wasn't that kind of residential concentration that you would get if there was a giant factory employing hundreds of workers. We didn't really have that here. So let's look a little bit more at what, what the other little Canadas would look like so that we can then later compare our little Canada to it. And that's what we're going to do uh, just very briefly. So uh, most of the typical little Canadas in, in uh, the northeast of the United States would usually have some giant factory in it. And this is the Androscoggin Mill of Lewiston, Maine. And in front of it is the is a canal that comes off the Androscoggin River, which is a river that powers through the city. So I just wanted to include this as an image because it shows how large the factories of, of industrial America could be at, at their height. Uh, so you see how many stories it has. You see how many hundreds of workers must have been employed in a place like this. And if all of them were French Canadians, these factories would send recruiting agents up to Canada to recruit workers because the French Canadians were known to be hardworking, industrious, um, uh, what's the word, uh, sober, and they had a tendency to avoid uni uh, trade unions uh, and to not easily, they weren't, they weren't easy to organize into labor unions. And 
perhaps one of the reasons why they weren't easy to organize into labor unions is that many of these workers were coming to work in the U.S. for a limited, in their minds they were coming for a limited amount of time. They weren't that committed to staying here. They were just coming to make some money and then, you know, not get rich, but, you know, make, make some savings and then go back home. So maybe if you're not in the country forever, you don't have a commitment to unionization because you don't really have a, a long-term stake in, in, you know, in staying there forever. Uh, again, this is the other side of the same canal that shows the Bates and the Hill mills. So most of these mills were making some kind of textile, uh, either cotton or wool. Uh, spinning and weaving uh, cotton. So, uh, so in, in Lewiston, Maine, unlike Plattsburgh, you had several mills all along these canals and the little Canada would be right next to it. And, and not only did you have large mills, you also had corporate housing. Uh, sure. Yeah, you had, you know, I guess the, the, the employers knew a good thing when they saw it. Here they had all these people who wanted to work for them and had nowhere to live. So they built what was, what was known as corporation housing. And what we're looking at here was uh, across the canal from the mills was corporation housing. Now, these are recent pictures. They're all abandoned. Uh, they would have been much more beautiful, well, nicer at the time that they were inhabited. But these were specifically uh, built for female workers. Because there was a fear that single women living on their own could, could potentially be, uh, what's the word, uh, in, in a kind of, What's the word? In a, in a, maybe they wouldn't be living in the right place, so they wouldn't be supervised properly, or they wouldn't have the proper sort of virtuous habits that, that they wanted their workers to have. By putting them in these female dormitories, it was a way of you know, having a curfew and regulating their lives. So, um, so imagine that you know, you'd live in a block and then cross, cross, the, the, cross the canal, work in the factory, and then worship in the church right next to it. So all in one place. Uh, the little Canadas of the Northeast uh, were often characterized by uh, poor living standards, uh, despite what I said before. The buildings were often put up in a ramshackle way. There wasn't, there wasn't standards like there are today. There weren't sort of, uh, sort of uh, government-imposed standards of buildings. So, uh, so here we see a picture that shows us the, the difficult living conditions in many of these industrial neighborhoods. And this is Lowell, Massachusetts. And these are French Canadian children uh, playing in the backyard of a of a of a sort of tenement area. Um, and here is an, uh, another giant mill. This is in Manchester, New Hampshire. This is the Amoskiag Mill, circa 1892. And you see the scale of it is simply phenomenal, isn't it huge? Yeah, and it curves along the canal, and you see the smokestacks along it. So this gives us a sense of the tremendous labor demands that, were, that existed at the time. There was like this infinite demand, unlike today, there was an infinite demand for unskilled labor of all kinds, and French Canadians uh, uh, footed the, fit the bill. Um, the, and the interior of these mills looked something like this. Row upon row of, you, here you see the cloth being woven on not, not, ho not a home loom, but on machines. So what the workers did in this kind of scenario, they didn't actually weave the cloth themselves. They simply supervised the machines, made sure everything was running smoothly. And they'd have many, many machines to, to overlook. Had to make sure everything was going, that no threads broke. Uh, so, and often the machines were dangerous, and mm -hmm. industrial accidents were, were quite frequent. Uh, you'd lose fingers, or you'd lose, uh, or, or worse. Uh, so, um, so it was uh, extremely noisy, extremely uh, what's the word? Um, hectic. Often the air was full of dust, kind of cloth dust, and they'd often get sick because of that. So they would work uh, 12, if not 15-hour days, from five in the morning, uh, from five in the morning till late at, late at night. Uh, so they worked a lot harder than we do today. They didn't have eight-hour work days like we do today. So here is an image of uh, the little Canada of Lewiston, Maine. And I kind of love this image because it shows you the church at the center of it. And you see at the top it says Ray LePage, Le right? So the names, the, the, those typical French names that you would see uh, in these uh, uh, industrial neighborhoods. So I uh, kind of like, that's a slide that's taken from the 1960s, but it shows us uh, what these industrial neighborhoods look like. All right, so here we get to this image that we saw previously, right? We saw this on another episode. Uh, and this shows us um, that by the year 1900, so many, so many French Canadians were living in the, nor in the northern part of New England that a new term emerged to describe them. And they were called, they, so, so, so essentially they didn't know, by this point, 
not only did we have working workers in the Northeast, we also had the emergence of uh, el educated elites. Doctors, lawyers, dentists, shopkeepers, uh, people who had education, priests as well, right? So by the 1900, you have the emergence of social stratification among in these communities. You have lots of people doing day labor, mill workers, you know, people do, involved in all those things we talked about in previous, uh, in previous uh, uh, segments. But now you're also beginning to have a middle class. And you're even starting to have some great success stories, like the Aubuchons, right? The Aubuchon Hardwares. Calvin, you've heard of Aubuchon, right? Is, is there an Aubuchon Hardware in Plattsburgh? Well, we did have one. We did I don't have think one. It exists anymore. Is it gone? Yeah. Yeah, there was beginning to emerge uh, a kind of an elite of uh, people who had leisure and could send their children to go to school, uh, mainly in Canada. They'd send their children to school in Canada. So you now had an educated elite. And this elite began to uh, explore uh, what, what were you going to call this community? Because they weren't French Canadians anymore because they had left Quebec. Uh, many of them now were first generation Americans. Their parents were from Canada. But they spoke French because their parents spoke French. They went to school. They would have gone to school here at Uville Co Convent or at Mount Assumption Institute. So they went to school par at least partially in French and they considered themselves to be part of this immigrant community. So by the year 1900, a new term emerged to describe this group, and they call themselves, perhaps for lack of a better word, they call themselves Franco-Americans, Franco-Americains. A bit of a strange word. So what does that mean? I mean, so a lot of people say Franco-American. What that means is spaghetti, right? Because <laughs> there's like that spaghetti that you can buy, yeah. right? Franco-American spaghetti. Uh, what does it mean to be Franco-American? So I, I guess what that means is you're an American with French heritage. You're an American who speaks French. Um, it's an interesting choice of, of words. They didn't call themselves canado américain they didn't call themselves Canadian Americans. They called themselves Franco-Americans, which would lead you to believe that they saw themselves more, that they identified with the fact of France more than Canada. It's an interesting choice of words. Um, but the, the term stuck. And they called themselves the Franco-Americans, and the term was used in their news, they founded newspapers, across the United States, French language newspapers, and the word Franco-American came to be uh, agreed upon as the term that you use to describe them. Hmm. So Plattsburgh has a Franco-American community, right? That's, that's the word that you would have used for it. So have a look at the, the map. Uh, as we discussed in a previous segment, the map is somewhat erroneous. It was made in 1976 uh, by a geographer. Uh, called Ralph Vis Vissero. It's missing some groups, which is upstate New York and Vermont. But I want to call your attention to the title of it. It says La franco Americani, right, in 1900. So Franco-America in 1900. So where did the French-speaking Canadians live in America? Well, they lived in Maine, not surprisingly, the areas that could be connected to Quebec by railway. So you have Lewiston, Maine, which was served by the Grand Trunk Railway. Uh, and then all these other towns in the southeast. But the map is erroneous because it doesn't show us New York State. New York State's blank. So somehow New York State is out, it gets left out of the story. And my mission, as you know, is to, oh, is of to, course you <laughs> is to restore that. You've done a great job in inserting it back there. Yeah, so we're, ex we're inserting it back in. And, here, and so we're going we're gonna to sort of continue. So one of the first things that the Franco-Americans did in order to establish a sense of, uh, to get over the sense of being far from home, the best way they had of, of restoring the sense of feeling cozy and at home was to build churches. And what we see here is one of the earliest churches that was built. This is Notre Dame of Southbridge, Massachusetts, which was built in 1869. And by Franco-American standards, 1869 is considered really early. But we know that St. Peter's, St. Pierre, was, was constructed, begun in 1853, mm -hmm. even earlier. So. So this confirms my theory that our, our, our community was earlier than, mo than most of the uh, uh, better known ones. Well, uh, as time passed and as the Franco-Americans became uh, more prominent, uh, more prosperous, uh, and more successful, 
the scale of the churches that they built increased dramatically. So what we're looking at here is uh, the sumptuous Église Saint-Pierre. It's again called Église Saint-Pierre, St. Peter's. This looks like a cathedral, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not a cathedral. It's just a church. It's a basilica. So this is Église Saint-Pierre et Saint-Paul of Lewiston, Maine. So imagine that this sort of neo-Gothic uh, edifice was built with the contribution of day laborers, s small sort of small uh, contributions of humble people. Can you see that in front of, at the very front of it, that there's a ground level? Mm -hmm. Can you see that there actually is a basement church? Can you look at how there's windows and then there's sub windows, mm -hmm. right? So there's a basement church for the early morning mass and there's actually so many faithful that you need to have two churches going on at all times. So it's a, an amazing, an amazing construction. So building, so there's a lot to be said for why they built these kind of church, th these large churches. And at the very most, most simple level, we can say that this, this caused them to be very proud of their community if they could build these beautiful Catholic churches. Because the Catholic church for them was a kind of center of their, of their culture. And this is a way of showing the people back in Quebec that they hadn't forgotten who they were. And they hadn't lost their, their, they hadn't lost their faith. They hadn't lost their, their traditions. In fact, maybe the churches of, of the United States were perhaps more impressive than the churches of Quebec. So it was a way of kind of, of saying, you know, just because we left Quebec doesn't mean that we're like the low life that left, you know, the kind of undesirables. In fact, you know, we were smart to leave because look, look, at, look at how well we did and look at how beautiful our churches are. They are the equal of your churches, if not superior to them. So it was a, a real point of pride uh, to have these uh, sumptuous churches. And no expense was spared on decorating the interiors of these churches. This church looks quite a bit like uh, our sure church does, in St. Peter's. It? Yeah, there was a certain style uh, that, that was reminiscent of r the churches of Quebec, and they, they wanted to try to reproduce that style of church. And this is the interior of the Church of St. Mary in Manchester, New Hampshire. And it has the, disting the distinction of being decorated by a, a Quebec artist known as Isaias Le Duc who's a really famous uh, Quebec painter. So frequently, uh, to finish the interior, they would bring artisans and artists from Quebec. And no doubt, the people who did the Church of St. Peter's of Plattsburgh came from Mon the Montreal region to do the carving and the decorating and the, the finishing of the church. So going inside such a church was like a little bit of home away from home. It was a little way of feeling like you were back at home even though you were in a foreign country. So, so this is why it was so important to have a, a church where you could feel uh, at home. Uh, and no expense was spared. And here we see some of the... Um, and here's what's so interesting. That if you look at the province of Quebec, most of the art that comes out of Quebec is religious art. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Because, I, because of the, the overwhelming Catholicism of, of the society, most of the art had a kind of uh, religious, uh, uh, most of it was produced for religious purposes. So here we see a detail of a winged angel with, with a trumpet. And this is at St. Anthony of Padua Church in New Bedford, Massachusetts. So these angels were on the top of the column. They were on the capital of the columns along the church. Uh, and uh, did I, I probably, did, did I not include a picture of those columns? No. So. We'll have to go back to that. So the, the story about these columns is that when you'd stare, if there was uh, these angels all along the tops of the columns, they said that when you would stare up at it, it was like being in heaven because you were surrounded by angels. So uh, no expense was paired, uh, spared in decorating the, chur the, the churches. Um, and here's another piece of religious art. This is the statue of St. Anne that was situated in a sanctuary of the same name in Fall River, Massachusetts. And this statue was considered by some to be the source of miracles. So the parish of St. Anne had its own patron saint, and there was a statue of her, St. Anne, and here we see it. So they began, to develop their, they began to develop their own sort of icons and their own sort of Franco-American iconology. And of course, the, the parish priest, or the curé, was the center of religious life. And here is a, uh, here is a, here is a rather wonderful, uh, wonderful, uh, picture taken from that book called Acadian Hard Times, who showed what the Catholic priests looked like in those days before Vatican II, right? They had long, long religious garbs, uh, sort of like, almost like a, uh, like a dress over, over their clothes. 
So the curé is what you called him, the, the curate, right? In French, mm -hmm. it's called a, a curé. Um, so the curate was the sort of center, the spiritual leader of uh, the parish life. And here we see uh, a really lovely, uh, lovely illustration showing, um, showing a nun um, instructing elementary school students. So how many of your parishioners would have gone to a school like this here in Plattsburgh where they would be taught by a nun um, in a very kind of basic school, school room? Um, and we see that we see that like the children are all sitting in rows and they look extremely well beha well behaved. <laughs> you have to point out that their knuckles are all hidden. <laughs> yeah. Because their knuckles got wrapped. Right. right. So their knuckles are all hidden. No <laughs> hands on the maybe they were told no hands on the table, right? Who knows? So? He, probably. Uh, there was no doubt a strict disciplinary regime um, to be contrasted to our rather free freewheeling times, right? Um, Children sat at their desks in rows. But Calvin's got bad memories about that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so Catholic nuns provided instruction relative, well, relatively cheaply because they had taken vows of poverty. So they were doing it kind of, they weren't expecting to be paid to do it. So they, they provided tremendous, um, tremendous sort of service to the Franco-American communities of the United States. Because the Franco-Americans were paying taxes for the public school system, but they chose to send their kids to private schools run by nuns. Because by doing that, they would have the kind of education that their kids would have at home. And it was a way of ensuring that they were familiar with their culture, didn't lose their culture, didn't become too assimilated uh, into American ways. But what's interesting about these Catholic schools is that eventually the schools themselves became tools for assimilation. Because initially they only taught, initially they would teach half the day in French and half in English. Because they didn't want the kids to not know English because they had to, you know, work in an American society. And eventually they, they just stopped teaching in French and, you know, by the end they only taught in English. So they, they, they themselves, I guess, uh, acclimatized or assimilated to the American main, mainstream. Right. So. In the streets of the cities of uh, the United States, the American citizens, the native-born Americans, were treated to a spectacle such that they had never seen before. Uh, and this is a Catholic pr processional. Uh, and we see that the, nun the nuns are essentially, on a feast day, proceeding through the, the streets of the town. So you can imagine what kind of effect this would have had on the Protestant sort of Yankees of New, of New England and upstate New York. They, you know, they probably thought this was a very strange display, uh, indeed. So I thought I thought it would sort of, you know, I thought it would give you some images of uh, Franco-American life that would show you some of, some of the sort of some of the ways that it might have looked, or how you know how it might have felt to be a French Canadian living in the United States. You would have seen something like this, and it would have meant something to you. That would have been your 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 community. Another thing that the church did was provide institutional support to these communities. And uh, what we see here is, uh, well, the nuns, would, the nuns would build hospitals. Um, they, would, uh, they, they would not, yes, they would build the actual hospitals and the nuns would serve as nurses in the hospitals. And, it, and, here, in, and here what we see here is St. Anne's Hospital of Fall River, Massachusetts, founded in 1906 and placed under the, the direction of the Dominican sisters. Uh, and the, the, the Dominican nuns came from France, from Tours. They didn't come from Canada. So when you needed nuns, you could either go to, the, you know, to, to Canada or you could go to France. And I do believe that here in Plattsburgh, uh, it was Catholic nuns that were responsible for this building, which was a hospital as well, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Champlain Valley Hospital, established by the Grey Nuns. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not exactly sure what year, but we did the research. So, w so right. We just don't remember. So this this room right here, I, I bet you, this room was like the mother superior or the director's room because there's a door there, and there the, these doors lead to this large room here, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe this is where you came. Maybe this is where you came and waited, waited, the, like the waiting room, and connected to her office so she could supervise it. Who knows? It's interesting to think about what this room would have served. Yeah. And below it, there are rooms that have like, you can see that there were sinks, there were operating rooms down below. Yeah. So uh, the Champlain Valley Physicians Hospital and this hospital owe their early origins to religious orders coming from Quebec. Yep. So 
it goes to show us that, you know, that the French Canadians were not only immigrants in this area, but they were responsible for the early sort of development of institutions, yeah. you know, schools and hospitals. Could have been a ward where you had several beds in here. Could have been a ward. I, I guess it could be. It's hard to tell. It's really hard to tell from here. And I have visited this hospital many times when it was a hospital, but. Somebody could probably tell us that. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Or else we could and find maybe they but, will. You know, I don't know. Something tells me that if you look at this beautiful fireplace, that this was not a ward, that this was a grand room where people, maybe it was an office, or maybe it was a visiting room, or a visiting room. You could visit patients here. I don't know. It's a good mm -hmm. question. Yeah, it's hard to kind of reconfigure it. Yeah. Yeah, so building of hospitals was, was really, uh, hospitals and schools provided early uh, institutional support for these communities at a relatively low cost to the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is what they did in Quebec as well, uh, at a relatively low cost to the ta taxpayer. And what's very interesting and what's about to come is that the Franco-American com uh, Franco community uh, even began to have, ah, there we go, we have, we have a slide that's backwards, so we have to kind of go back and do this again. All right, we paused for just a moment, but you didn't. I know you didn't leave your television sets. Where are we now? Well, we are actually at a really interesting uh, uh, juncture because I wanted to show your viewers that uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, the French, the French Franco-Americans, uh, not only are they building churches and having their own sort of uh, American Catholic church, they also begin to have uh, certain... Uh, certain religious figures that they begin to venerate who are uh, figures that come from their own community. And this is an interesting image of a woman called Marie-Rose Ferron, Ferron. Um, and she was known as, uh, the slide shows you, it says what she was, it says, une stigmatisée canadienne résidente aux États-Unis, right? Mm -hmm. A Canadian stigmatic residing in the United States. So born in 1902, died early in 1936 at a, at a relatively young age. Uh, and this woman, Mary Rose Ferron, uh, was subject, she was the, uh, a subject of a cult in the United States. And she was an ecstatic, uh, a religious woman that was extremely sort of, what's the word, had a very intense spiritual experience. And to be a stigmatisé means that you have markings on your body uh, that show uh, suffering. Yeah. Yeah. All of the crucifixion. Yeah. The, of the crucifixion. Yes. So, uh, so Mary Rose Ferron was considered to be a kind of early, like a Franco-American, a saintly woman of, of the Franco-American com uh, community. Um, she was born in Saint Germain de Grattan, which is uh, uh, in the eastern townships of Quebec, on the 24th of May in 1902, and her parents emigrated to Fall River, Massachusetts, in 1905. So she had quite a wide reputation uh, in the Franco-American community as a holy woman. By this point, by the early, by the 20th century, and even, even well, well before that, the Franco-Americans uh, are having their own, uh, what's the word, national holiday, uh, which is every year they would have a parade to celebrate St. Jean Baptiste Day. And St. John the Baptist was the patron saint of, the, of, French, of French Canada. And his feast day, the Catholic feast day of St. John is the 24th of June. So on that date, the Franco-Americans would have had a large, they'd have a, a big parade, and they would have put up these kind of um, temporary ar arches like this one here, uh, that, so that the, parade, the, the paraders would be able to sort of march th through it and it says on the arch, it says, Soyez les bienvenus, which means welcome, right? Uh, yes, that's exactly what it says. It says welcome. So hard to see what flag they would be flying on the top there. Um, it's pretty hard to figure that out. Uh, but this would happen close enough, to, close enough to the 4th of July, but sometimes it was happening on the same, sometimes they would combine the two. Uh, but they would have uh, parades and they'd have horse-drawn wagons that were decorated with historical themes of old, old French Canada. And once again, this was a way of having pride in their community. And we have uh, uh, interesting images of the same thing going on in Plattsburgh that I'll, I will show you at a, at a later date, no doubt. Um, the, 
tercentenary of the discovery of Lake Champlain, they had uh, parades as well. And there was a special French parade. And I even have slides of the wagons, the, the sort of, the sort of procession, processions and the wagons that they used uh, in those days. So this is the kind of thing that you would have seen in Plattsburgh every summer on the 24th of June. They would have had their feast day uh, of St. John the Baptist. And it's very interesting. This, in Quebec, this is still a holiday. Only now they call it, now they call it la fête nationale. <laughs> right? Because it's been secularized. Sure. They don't call it St. John the Baptist Day anymore because it's just sort of too old fashioned. So they simply call it the national holiday. And it's kind of interesting to point out that when they say national holiday, they, they're kind of assuming that Quebec is a nation, right? Because <laughs> Canada, yeah. is Canada, Canada Day is the first of, Ju of July, right? Mm -hmm. So. There's two, there's two sort of Fourth of Julys in Quebec, depending on where your, where your s sympathies lay, right? If you're a Federalist, you celebrate Canada Day on First of July. If you're a sovereigntist who wants to break Quebec out of Canada, your big holiday is the 24th of June, Saint Jean Baptiste Day, where you know there's a huge party uh, in Montreal. So the whole city, the whole city is um, sort of fate, uh, uh, what's the word, fating, having a big holiday. So I thought this would make a good, uh, a convenient sort of, the next thing I wanted to talk to you about was um, famous French Canadians. Because by the, by the, by the late 19th century, 19, 1890s, 1900s, the 1910s, you, not only do you have an elite emerging, but you also have uh, Fran Franco-Americans, let's call them what they would have called themselves, who are beginning to make their mark in American society. So the next group of slides that I had for you was showing you um, Franco-Americans who became famous, either as, for various things, either as singers or baseball players or strongmen, um, illustrators. So they, Frank, French Canadians have made a, a very huge contribution to American uh, society. And the next little series is to show some, some of the heroes uh, of the French Canadian community. People that they could point to and say, look, this is one of ours. Oh, sure. And they became mayors or Supreme Court judges or, you know, governors or uh, Hall of Fame baseball players. So, so there's a lot more for us to look at. You mean there might be another chapter? There might be a chapter three and a chapter four and a yeah. chapter five. <laughs> this is number three, which we've concluded. Time flies when you're having fun. We checked our tape a minute ago and saw that we had an, an hour and 40 minutes and said, yeah, that might be a good place to stop and we'll do it again. Yeah, we realized. We always, as long as you have the invitation out, we're going to uh, come back. Well, you know that. The welcome mat is always out there. That's wonderful. Yeah. What a pleasure it's been to come back here again to Champlain Valley Hall on the campus of Plattsburgh State and talk to Dr. Sylvie Boudreau, who knows a great deal about the French connection. It's just an extreme pleasure, and she's just bubbling with energy. I don't know if this will... Are, are you going to sit on my chair? Are you going to sit on... I want you no, to sit I'm, on the chair. Come on, If come I on, sit Gordy, on I that chair... On, no, come on, Gordy. You have to sit on it. You've right. got to realize yeah. that we... Well, he's going to sit on the we, chair. We... No, he's got to sit on it because he doesn't think that he can, but we, I want... I want to <laughs> How well built this chair is. There's some invitation. <laughs> we, we have video and still pictures at home of many chairs collapsing. No, Colla no, no, no. Don't move it just as I'm ready to sit down. Okay, okay I'll, I'll be so careful. Oh, I'll be careful. Oh, look at this. See? Did you hear a groan? It wasn't my groan. <laughs> it was Calvin saying, oh, no, Gordy's going to wreck another chair. <laughs> Sylvie, thanks so much for having us again. You're very welcome. We, we ended it on a happy note. <laughs> the chair is still standing, and I will soon <laughs> be standing. Thank you so much for watching this program. Support it by telling all of your friends about it. I n never a day goes by when we don't get a call asking, when are you going to run so-and-so? Can I buy a copy of so-and-so? For anybody who asks questions about our little corner or anything else Calvin and I do, call Calvin at Hometown Cable, Hometown Cable 298-4663 in the northern tier. He's the man who knows. And who knows where we're going to be next time for our little